Good evening, everyone. It is such a pleasure to see all of you here. We are very excited by your presence today at the 15th lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor Derek Attridge, Emeritus Professor of English and Related Literature, University of York, who is here to deliver the talk we are all looking forward to titled Joycean Form, Emotion and Late Modernist Fiction, Elman Stuck's Newbury Port, and McCarthy's The Making of Incarnation. We will be recording today's lecture, and at the same time, it is being live streamed for our audience and subscribers on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor Etridge's talk, and all of you are requested to kindly post your questions in the chat box, which will then be addressed to Professor Etridge. This lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department, Professor Simi Malhotra. I request Simi Ma'am to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce Professor Atridge. Thank you, Sakshi. Uh, Professor Derek Atridge, our distinguished speaker this evening, Professor Isabel Karaman, and all others who have joined us from different parts of the world. I, on behalf of the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia, and our collaborating partner, Department of English and American Studies, University of Woodsburg, Germany, extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this Ministry of Education Spark supported Distinguished Lecture Series. Friends, this is the 15th lecture of our series, which is a part of the project on new terrains of consciousness, globalization, sensory environments, and local cultures of knowledge. We're indeed fortunate to have with us Professor Derek Atridge, one of the celebrated academics of our times as our distinguished speaker this evening. It is an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Atridge and we are all eagerly waiting to hear him speak on Joycean form, emotion, and late modernist fiction. I'm grateful to Professor Atridge for taking out time for us and for being so generous with his time and scholarship and for agreeing to be a part of our series. I thank you, Professor Atridge. I welcome you, and now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Atridge formally, though he needs no introduction whatsoever. Emeritus Professor Derek Attridge is a professor of English and related literature at the University of York and a fellow of the British Academy. Born in South Africa, he is taught in Britain, the United States, France, and Italy. Professor Attridge did his BA at the University of Natal, South Africa, and came to the UK to complete further degrees at Cambridge. After a research lectureship at Christ Church, Oxford, he taught at the University of Southampton, uh, then moved to a chair of English studies at Strathclyde University. In 1988, he took up a professorship at Rutgers University, returning to the UK in 1998 to join the University of York's Department of English and Related Literature, where he is now Emeritus Professor. He has held visiting positions at a number of universities, including Oxford, Cape Town, Paris 7, Sassari, Northwestern University, Queensland, and the American University of Cairo, to name just a few. Professor Attridge has also held fellowships from the Gegenheim Foundation, the Camargo Foundation, and the Leverhulme Trust. Professor Attridge's interests center on the language of literature, but radiate in many different directions. He is well known as a Joyce scholar, having published several works on Joyce, and served for many years as a trustee of the International James Joyce Foundation. He's also interested in poetry and poetic form, reflected most recently in his 2019 book, The Experience of Poetry, From Homer's Listeners to Shakespeare's Readers. Professor Derek Attridge has published 24 books as author or editor in four main areas, literary theory, poetic form, the works of James Joyce, and South African literature. He serves on more than 20 editorial boards across these fields. He was awarded the inaugural Robert Fitzgerald Prosody Prize in 1999, and his book, The Singularity of Literature, received the 2006 European Society for the Study of English Prize for Literary Study. Among his publications are also Joyce Effects on Language Theory and History, 2000, Joan Quetze, and the Ethics of Reading, Literature in the Event, 2004, How to Read Joyce, 2007, Cambridge History of South African Literature, which he co-edited with David Atwell in 2012, Moving Words, Forms of English Poetry, 2013, The Craft of Poetry, Dialogues on Minimal Interpretation, 2015, and The Work of Literature, 2015. Professor Atridge, it is such an honor, 
for us to get to host you and to listen to you. And we're so, so eagerly looking forward to hearing you. And we cannot thank you enough for agreeing to be here. Over to you, Professor Adridge. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Simi. It's very good to meet you, at least face to face, if not in person, after our many conversations on email. And it's a great pleasure to, to be here and and at least in Zoom fashion to be um, taking part in this wonderful series of, of lectures. It's an honor for me to be among those given the opportunity to address an audience in this way. So um, I'm going to share my screen, if I can get that to work so that you don't have to see great big face all the time. It's working, but it's going ahead of itself. Right. This talk will take about 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. And I look forward to receiving questions from um, people wherever they are um, in the chat function. The talk has five parts. Part one, I want to start with a rough sketch of what I take to be the different categories of emotional response evoked by fictional texts, before moving on to an examination of two recent novels that owe a great deal to James Joyce's example, novels that I'm calling late modernist. This isn't a label I set a great deal of store by, and I'm aware that it's been used in other ways. If it can be granted that modernism refers to a mode of writing rather than to a specific period, we could just call these novels modernist. If we're willing to accept that a modernist novel can be still written in our own day, I would claim the title for these two that I'm going to talk about. The categories of emotional response I'm going to propose aren't watertight, but they will help us to register the enormous complexity of feelings aroused by literary works, even those far removed from the thriller or the tearjerker, which are obviously intended to arouse emotions. I'd like to propose four categories. Category one, responses to factors external to the literary work. These include such affective states as anticipation or disappointment on perceiving how few pages are left to read, irritation at the cramped print, or pleasure in the attractive design, and frustration on not being able to remember the names of characters. This category is one I won't be paying very much attention to. Secondly, responses to the work as the production of a particular author, a real biographical figure. Here I would place admiration for the skill exhibited in crafting the work. Disappointment if a work fails to meet the standards set by the author's earlier works and astonishment at the magnitude of the labor involved in writing the work also in this category, are uh, emotions aroused as a result of biographical knowledge. We may feel compassion for an author who wrote under terrible conditions, for instance, or be moved by references to emotional incidents in the writer's own life. Thirdly, responses to the work as the production of a narrator or and or an implied author. Here too, we may feel admiration for the verbal artistry on display, but this time, not that of the actual author, but of a character created by the text, whether we think of this character as the narrator or a presence behind the narrator, or maybe both. It's often not possible to separate this type of admiration from type two admiration. In Lolita, for instance, we take pleasure in Nabokov's verbal craft at the same time as taking pleasure, perhaps a somewhat dubious pleasure, if you know that novel, in his first person narrator, Humbert Humbert's verbal craft. An inventive work of art also produces the hard to define feeling of new horizons opening up, something I've discussed in other publications. Other emotions can include surprise or even shock at unexpected narrative turns, tension, perhaps anxiety, at the appearance of clues to some approaching calamity, amusement at a witty turn of phrase, 
or satisfaction at the achievement of narrative resolution. And of course, there are, there are many more. And category four, responses to the represented content of the fictional world, including characters, events, and scenes. The emotions here are of a different order from those in category, categories one to three, which are directly experienced. Those are real emotions in response to features of the text. But in this case, the emotions are mediated by the fictionality of the work and controlled by the formal operations of the language. Empathy for a character can give rise to any number of emotions, whether they are shared with the character, such as joy, fear, trepidation, relief, boredom, excitement, or evoked by the character, the feelings we might feel towards another person, like admiration, annoyance, regret, amusement, and more. The depicted events and scenes can also evoke a strong affective response. Amazement, fascination, satisfaction, bafflement, and so on. To the extent that these are, these are responses to the represented world and not to the unfolding of the narrative, which isn't always an easy distinction to make, they are, as it were, performed emotions, feelings experienced from a slight distance. The happiness you might feel when Darcy proposes to Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice, or the fear you might feel when Magwitch starts up in the graveyard in Great Expectations, are not exactly the same as the happiness or fear you would experience in the wake of similar events outside a book. If, uh, if you were actually in a, in a graveyard and a a terrible man suddenly started up from behind a gravestone, you'd feel something a little more direct than what we feel in reading Great Expectations. When a when narrator of a novel is a character with a distinctive personality, categories three and four may be overlaid. We respond both to the verbal texture and to the fictional individual producing it. We'll come to some examples of this later. A possible fifth category would be what Cian Nye calls meta feelings, the feeling, feelings we are having about the feelings we are having or sometimes not having. In the realist novel, these categories are for the most part kept separate. We respond to Jane Austen's narrator's ironies, appreciations, disappointments, while responding differently but simultaneously to the, the actions and words of her characters. Even in a first person narration, such as Great Expectations, different feelings are evoked by the world depicted and by Pip's narration of that world with its misapprehensions and retrospective judgments. But things tend to get more complicated with modernism. Part two. <clears throat> in an interview, Tom McCarthy asserted, you can do you can no more ignore Joyce than you can Darwin. If you ignore Darwin, you're a creationist. And this is where the bulk of the mainstream British novel is now, back in the 19th century. Lucy Ellman is on record as saying, Joyce changed my life and my attitude to what literature could do. These two contemporary novelists build on very different facets of Joyce's achievement with different consequences. And this is what I'll be elaborating in the rest of this talk. For one thing, McCarthy rates Finnegan's Wake high, highly, whereas Elman has stated that she has never read it. Just looking at the opening of Elman's Duck's new report reveals its debt to the Penelope episode of Ulysses. That's a couple of typical pages of Duck's new report and two typical pages of the Penelope episode of Ulysses. On first encountering the solid blocks of type that represent Molly Bloom's nighttime ruminations in the final chapter of Ulysses, and having to face the challenge of language without the usual signaling of sentence breaks and abbreviations, the major feeling evoked in the reader is likely to be frustration, which would be an example of category one. But since, but once one has learned to read this version of English, 
The winningness and humor of the episode shine through, emphasized by the rapidity of thought enacted through the typographical pe peculiarities. Character two, ca category two emotional responses, responses to the author himself, to James Joyce, may include admiration for Joyce as a writer, for his verbal skill, his stylistic inventiveness, his handling of comedy, his insights into human thought processes. I'm glad to say that these days we don't hear quite so often about his insight into the feminine mind. When we turn to categories three and four, the affective response to the narrator and the rest represented world, we find that the two in part coalesce. Molly is the effective narrator and among the objects represented is her teeming mind. The people, places and events that enter her thoughts are mediated for us by her distinctive mental style and forceful attitudes. So that we seldom respond to them as entities in their own right. Everything that is, is colored by Molly's views on them. The emotions playing through Molly's thoughts are constantly shifting as she replays memories, anticipates future events, and assesses the individuals she knows or has come across. Here, for instance, are her reflections on her husband Leopold's male companions. They're a nice lot, all of them. Well, they're not going to get my husband again into their clutches, if I can help it, making fun of him then behind his back, I know well, when he goes on with his idiotics, because he has sense enough not to squander every penny piece he earns down their gullets and looks after his wife and family. Good for nothings. Poor Paddy Dignam, all the same. I'm sorry in a way for him. What are his wife and five children going to do? Unless he was insured, comical little teetotum, or was stuck up in some pub corner, and her or her son waiting. Bill Bailey, won't you please come home? Her widow's weeds won't improve her appearance. They're awfully becoming, though, if you're good looking. Scorn for the men in question is combined with protectiveness for her husband, which then morphs into affection, then compassion for the Dignam family. It's a bit odd that she feels sorry for Paddy Dignam, who's actually dead. But, but for compassion for the family after the father's death, which turns into mockery of Paddy himself, a comic snatch of popular song, and then disparagement of Mrs. Dignam. Finally, there's a suggestion of self-admiration in the thought of the good-looking wearer of a mourning outfit. The affective response of the reader is likely to be, above all, amusement, mixed with admiration for the character's forcefulness, especially as a woman in a male-dominated world. There's perhaps also a degree of disapproval at a rather savage put-down of the dignums. Our amusement is in part produced by the verbal comedy, uh, his idiotics, uh, comical little teetotum, an example of category three, and partly by the created character herself with her rapidly fluctuating judgments and forceful expressions. Extended over a 24,000 word chapter, this lively and plausible articulation of the mental voyaging of a single character produces an unusual sense of empathetic involvement. It also brings home how much may be going on in one person's mind at a given moment. Part three, exactly the same could be said about Lucy Allman's magnum opus, Duck's Newburyport. It's by far the most ambitious of Allman's works, which offer the most part lighthearted comic novels playing freely with the conventions of the genre. This novel is very long. The Galley Beggar Press edition, as you see, uh, runs to over a thousand pages. And as you've already seen, many of those pages have many words on them. And the excellent audio book lasts for 45 hours. And for, the, for most of its length, it remains within the mental world of a single character. Its title refers to an event mentioned by this character at various points in the novel. When her mother was two years old, she waded into a pond after some ducks and would have drowned if her older sister, who couldn't swim, had not rescued her. Mary Ellman, Lucy Ellman's mother and a well-known feminist author, was born in Newburyport in Massachusetts. And it seems possible, perhaps even probable, that the story of her near drowning is based on a real event. 
reviewers had been quick to make the connection with Joyce, an association made even more likely given that Lu Lucy Elman's father was the eminent Joyce scholar, Richard Elman. The original paperback features a quote from Cosmopolitan on the front cover. Ulysses has nothing on this, though as you can see from the image in later printings, this was replaced by a quote from Vogue, a masterpiece like no other. Uh, the marketing people were probably advised that the reference to Joyce uh, didn't help sales. The more specific debt to the Penelope episode emerged indirectly in reviews of the novel when the erroneous idea got around that the non-stop outpouring of thoughts occurs in eight sentences, like Joyce's chapter. So several reviews said, oh yes, eight, eight sentences make up the, the, the monologue throughout the book. In an interview, Elman was characteristically acerbic on this question. She said, I'm planning to get, and in capitals, one sentence, not eight, put on my tombstone. That should settle the matter, right? So it is indeed one long sentence uh, punctuated by uh, this other narrative about the mountain lion. On beginning the novel, the reader finds herself involved in a rather traditional and conventionally told story of a mountain lion and her cubs, seen from the mother animal's perspective. But halfway down the second page, after a string of dots, something more surprising happens. The fact that the raccoons are now banging an empty yogurt carton around on the driveway, the fact that in the early morning stillness, it sounds like gunshots, the fact that even in fog with ice on the road and snow banks blocking their vision, people are already zooming around our corner, the site of many a minor accident. The fact that a guy in a pickup once accidentally skidded into our garage, and next time it could be our house or a child. Wake up picture day, dicamba, Kleenex. The fact that a pickup truck killed Dilly, and so on. It goes on and on and on. And as you see already, the phrase, the fact that occurs as the, as the opening of each successive uh, thought. So we now find ourselves in suburban North America in an early winter's morning, and we start to process the clues to the personality and preoccupations of the character to whose thought world we are being exposed. We're in the presence of someone with strong opinions, the emphasis implied by the italics, contributing to the sense of an, of an internal voice imbued with emotions. Of course, it's not an exact transcription of thought. In fact, it sometimes sound more, sounds more written than thought. Phrases like, in the early morning stillness, or many a minor accident. Not, probably not the way one would think these things. But the reading convention we've internalized allow us to interpret it as thought, as is the case with Molly Bloom. There are also many typographical features that belong on the printed page, such as figures in large bold type representing shaped cakes or musical notes. And the same, again, is true of the Penelope episode. The distinctive rhythm of this prose is created in part by the varied length of the utterances that follow the repeated phrase, the fact that. Sometimes just a few words, sometimes several lines, forming a partly retrievable sequence of associations interrupted at intervals by song titles or quotes from songs italicized and enclosed in music, musical notes, quotes from poems, capitalized headlines, which often sound like clickbait that you encounter on the internet, nine things you never knew about Miley Cyrus, or a dad's heart-wrenching moment, and these single items that often develop into lists. These interruptions become part of the verbal world of the novel, expected, though always surprising, when they occur. There's a short example of a list in this extract. Wake up picture day, dicamba, Kleenex, which seem to come from nowhere to, to interrupt the flow. Wake up, uh, sorry, uh, dicamba is a herbicide banned in some US states in 2017 because of damage caused by drifting. And actually there are clues later in the novel that reveal that, that this 
thought process and this morning in the in the kitchen is taking place in 2017. So the dicamba banning would have been uh, news at the time. Wake up picture day is only explained later in the work. It's a sign that appears occasionally outside the school, indicating, quote, you're supposed to draw a picture as soon as you wake up based on your dreams. And I guess we all know what Kleenex is. But what links these three items, presumably appearing in an unbidden string in the thinker's mind? Here, as in many other places, we have to accept the randomness, randomness of thought, at least until a connection strikes us, which in my experience, it frequently fails to do. Duck's Newbury Port, although it owes much to Penelope, is, an even more faithful, is even more faithful to thought processes in this respect. If we were able to listen in to another person's thoughts, we wouldn't find the smooth sequence of related expressions all making sense, characteristic of classic modernist stream of consciousness writing, as in Wolf or Dorothy Richardson. What emerges from this onrush of words is a mind packed with memories, associations, verbal tics, hopes, fears, and much more. An ordinary mind, in other words, though never before represented with such comprehensiveness in a novel. If one had to defend the length of the work, it would be in similar terms to an explanation of the length of the Penelope episode, only by the multiplication of items well beyond the conventional norms of the novel can the extraordinary richness of the mental world of the average human being be conveyed. As the character herself says halfway through the book, the fact that I just realized that when this monologue in my head finally stops, I'll be dead, or at least totally unconscious, like a vegetable or something. Also reflected in the packed accumulation of factual detail is the barrage of information we now negotiate every day. It's a novel for the Google age. At the same time, as responding to the gallimorphy of associations, memories, lists, sound bites, and other verbal matter, part of our experience of the novel is that a personal history gradually takes shape. We learn that the woman whose thoughts we're following lives in the wonderfully named Newcomers Town, a real town in uh, Ohio. That she's a professional baker, working from home, having given up her job as a part-time college lecturer after a bout with cancer, that she's married to Leo, her second husband, whom she adores, that she has four children, and so on. We're not expressing disquiet over the condition of America, especially the prevalence of gun crime and the despoiling of the environment. She's worrying about her children, agonizing about her baking, marveling at Leo's love for her, reflecting on her mother's illness and death, and bringing to consciousness a dozen other recurrent personal preoccupations. It doesn't take a great deal of familiarity with Elman's own past history to realize that many of the features of her character's life mirror those of her author. A plot of, time, of sort emerges as time passes, including a painful dental procedure, a roadside emergency in freezing conditions, a flood, a runaway daughter, and as if to justify all the woman's anxieties about gun crime, a holdup in her home. As with the Penelope episode of Ulysses, responses to the novel are likely to include an initial feeling of intimidation by the ocean of type on most pages. To an even greater degree than would be the case with Joyce's work. The more conventional lioness narrative with which the sequence of thoughts is interrupted uh, in, in dispersed which I'm not going to talk about, occupies only about 3% of the text. Category two feelings might include admiration for Elman's achievement in crafting such an immense, complex, entertaining novel. For readers with background knowledge, there will also be poignant reminders of the two short lives of Elman's own parents who appear in not very disguised forms. Her father dying of motor neurone disease at the age of 69, her mother confined to a wheelchair for the last 20 years of her life after unsuccessful surgery for a cerebral hemorrhage and dying of breast cancer at 68, two years after her husband. A few readers, like myself, will have known the Elman family personally, adding to the poignancy of these moments. But for most readers, the emotional impact of the woman's many expressions of her sense of deep loss 
will belong to the fourth category, a mediated sharing of the character's affective experience. Among the category three responses are the pleasures of recognition, both of items mostly trivial that trigger associations in the reader's world and of items that had appeared before in the text. For much of the time though, like Penelope, Dux fuses categories three and four. Our amused enjoyment is equally at the associative energy of the verbal narrative and at the character's own honesty, ethical fretfulness and mental agility. Her predominant emotion is anxiety, but her thought processes often come across as funny, usually without meaning to me. To give a proper sense of the effective experience of reading a novel for those who don't know it, one would have to quote several pages. I have to restrict myself to a passage of a few lines. The fact that it's getting so you're nervous to be in any public place now, in case there's a shooter, and that, does, that just doesn't seem right. The fact that half of all fatal shootings begin as domestic incidents. Half. Weird. The fact that with kids around, we often end up with a lot of overripe bananas. And that's handy for banana bread, ivy patch, peaches and cream, mommy, losing mommy, buttercups. I am little buttercup, sweet little buttercup. Corns, swollen ankles, frostbite, lipstick. The fact that it's really microbes that rule the world and they'll just readjust themselves if we nuke ourselves, I guess. My plight, plight my truth. The fact that, heavens to Betsy, I sure hope my current plight is not being repeated on 60 million other planets, the Milky Way, and so on. The woman's disquiet about shootings, a recurrent topic in her thoughts, is mixed with astonishment brought out by the italics, and the reader may experience a version of these feelings. But the unexpected shift to a concern with overripe bananas is comic and gives rise to a series of odd associations, including a snatch of Gilbert and Sullivan, which are also amusing, except that they include the sudden stab of loss in mommy, losing mommy, a phrase that encourages a sympathetic response. There's none of the intense emotional pull of the great realist novels, but the reader is carried along on a dance of fluctuating feelings, invited both to laugh at the predicaments and obsessions of one person, as in Penelope, and to experience some fellow feeling with regard to the state of the world today. <clears throat> Part four. Penelope is not the only episode of Ulysses lying behind Buck's Newburyport. The woman's wide ranging curiosity and associative leaps also owe something to Leopold Bloom's interior monologue. And the lists, which can grow in length to a page or even more, sound a bit like the periodic lists in Cyclops. Occasionally these lists acquire an impersonal, self-generated quality. Here's an example from early in the book. The fact that all in all, we're really just a normal joy, pledge, crest, tide, dove, wool like palm olive, Clorox, Rolex, Pepto, Bismol, Alka-Seltzer, Dissitin, Advil, Aleve, Tylenol, Anacin, Bayer, Exedrin, Vitamin C, Kleenex, Kotex, Tampax, Altoid, Barbara, Almay, Revlon, Cetaphil, Right Guard, Old Spice, Gillette, Q-Tip, Johnson & Johnson, Vaseline, Listerine, Head & Shoulders, Safe Owl, Eagle Brand, Jolly Green Giant, Lander Lakes, Lucerne, Seal, Chest, Clover, Blue Bonnet, Half and Half, Snyder, Van Camp, Wishbone, French's Skyline, Empress, Gerber, Nabisco, Heinz, Craft, Quaker Oats, Sunkiss, Purina, Vlasic, Oreo, Shredded Wheat, Arm and Hammer, Jello, Pears, Sara Lee, Chocolate Nuts, Libby's, Pepperidge Farm, Fleischmann's, Morton, General Mills, King Arthur, Bell's, Reese's Pieces, Kind of Household, like everybody else. While continuing to provide an insight into the multiple associations that the human mind is capable of running through in a few minutes, the text starts to take on a life of its own, as though it's no longer in the business of representing a character's thoughts, even though this is presented as a single sentence expressing what a normal family they are, um, it, it uh, seems to go well beyond that. In doing so, it, it becomes aligned with a different episode of Ulysses, an episode that has been much less influential on later novelists. 
one that Joyce said was his favourite, though he also called it the ugly duckling of the book, Ithaca, the penultimate episode in which Leopold Bloom takes Stephen Dedalus home with him in the small hours of June the 17th, 1904. The adjective commonly used to describe the emotional climate of Ithaca is cold. Joyce himself wrote to Frank Bunjan that he was, quote, writing Ithaca in the mode of a mathematical catechism, so that not only will the reader know everything and know it in the baldest, coldest way, but Bloom and Stephen thereby become heavenly bodies, wanderers like the stars at which they gaze. End of quote. Here's a representative sample of the chapter's question and answer style. What lay under exposure on the lower middle and upper shelves of the kitchen dresser opened by Bloom? On the lower shelf, five vertical breakfast plates, six horizontal breakfast saucers on which rested inverted breakfast cups, a moustache cup uninverted and saucer of Crown Derby, four white gold-rimmed egg cups, an open chamois purse displaying coins, mostly copper, and a file of aromatic violet comfits. On the middle shelf, a chipped egg cup containing pepper, a drum of table salt, four conglomerated black olives in oleaginous paper, an empty pot of plum trees potted meat, an oval wicker basket bedded with fiber and containing one Jersey pear, a half empty bottle of William Gilby and Co's white invalid port, half disrobed of its swathe of coral pink tissue paper, a packet of Ebbs soluble cocoa, five ounces of Anne Lynch's sauce of choice tea at two shillings per pound in a crinkled lead paper bag, a cylindrical canister containing the best crystallized lump sugar, and so on. Emotional it is not. Feelings aroused by this chapter might include admiration for the author for his refusal, refusal of novelistic convention, which is a category two response, and surprise coupled with amusement at the narration itself, category three. There are some moments that convey insight into the emotional state of the two characters named, but category four affect is relatively weak. We're not invited to feel very strongly the um, personalities and in inner worlds of Stephen and Bloom, as uh, Joyce himself claimed in that comment. Perhaps this is an example of Sian Nye's meta feeling, our feeling that we're not having and are not invited to have feelings. Nevertheless, read in the context of the novel as a whole, the narration does more than simply present affectless catalogues. In this passage, for instance, many of the items on the kitchen dresser have emotional significance for Bloom and offer readers both the pleasure of recognition, category three, and a touch of empathy for the character, category four. This presupposes that the reader at this point has a good enough memory to recognize these items from earlier in the book. The moustache cap, the moustache cup, we know was a present from his daughter Millie about whom he's very worried. The chipped egg cup was used to sprinkle pepper on his breakfast kidney at the beginning of the day. And the comforts, as the next episode, the Penelope episode, will reveal, were Molly's attempts, attempt to disguise her breath after her liaison with Blaze's Boylan. A little later, Bloom is going to discover in the marital bed incriminating crumbs of the potted meat that, he's, that is on the shelf, already associated with both domestic bliss and funerary containers. And as for the basket of port and pears, we witnessed Boylan purchasing it that afternoon. We're left to intuit Bloom's emotions on seeing this evidence of his wife's adultery, and in this very act, share something of them. Further category four affect is provoked by the apparently impersonal narratives, impersonal narrative voices choice of vocabulary, bedded and disrobed, for instance, are hardly neutral adjectives. Part five. Tom McCarthy's The Making of Incarnation, published last year, is a rare example of a late modernist novel following the path of the Ithaca episode rather than the Penelope episode. 
McCarthy's first novel, Remainder, was published in 2005 by a small French art publisher after being rejected by mainstream publishing houses and demonstrated that a novel can be, can be a compelling read without the conventional norms of character and plot. It rapidly gained a following, especially after an article by Zadie Smith in the New York Review of Books, which hailed it as pointing the way forward for the novel and was soon republished by a larger publisher. The works that followed, Men in Space, 2007, actually written earlier than Remainder, but uh, McCarthy couldn't find a publisher for it at the time, C, 2010, and Saturn Island, 2015, all played with the conventions of the realist novel, though in different ways. The title of this novel refers to an imagined science fiction film, aspects of whose production we are wit we witness, and also to the ever-present theme of the material body and its movement in space. There's little sense of a narrator whose feelings might engage us. Technical language abounds, and the reader may well feel ex may well experience feelings of irritation at having to work so hard, especially on a first reading, at tracking characters and following pl uh, plot developments through the web of unfamiliar vocabulary. That's a category one effect, of course. There are pleasures of recognition, both internally as the threads of the narrative are dropped and picked up, and externally as allusions are, re are registered. The most prominent of these being the rewriting of Wagner's opera Tristan and Isolde as a space drama, without apparently any of those involved in its production being aware of the coincidence. Such narrative drive as the novel possesses is created by the search on the part of a number of agents for the mysterious Box 808, one of a series constructed by Lillian Gilbreth, a fascinating real historical character, as part of her study of the movements of the human body. At the climax of the narrative, Mark Foken, one of those on the trail of the missing box, makes his way with a stopover in Bergen to watch some acrobats at work, to the house in, the, in Riga of Rivis Vanins, a retired Soviet physicist whose path-breaking discovery, the box, box 808, is said to concretize. He meets Vanins, but fails to get the information he's seeking. And later, returning to the house with the old man's granddaughter after an outing, enters the aviary situated in the grounds. The granddaughter, with whom he had earlier made love in this very aviary, goes, runs ahead, and we're given the scene that confronts Foken when he follows her, as follows. She's kneeling on the ground inside their little bower. He's floating above her, like a saint or cosmonaut, or rather, since the rope running between him and the beam, quite visible, belies the illusion of weightlessness a Bergen acrobat, if you subtracted all the energy and motion. Few accounts of the discovery of a hanged corpse have been less charged with emotion. Foken's obsession with bodily movement and his memory of the recent visit to Bergen trump any powerful affective response on his part. There's even an allusion to McCarthy's earlier novel, Men in Space, for the acute reader to pick up. And yet, in its avoidance of direct emotion, the passage, it seems to me, is all the more powerful. It requires the reader to do the work of transforming the oblique language into the horror of a suicide. The discovery of the notorious box 808 that ensues is, with typical McCarthyan refusal of conventional, conventional climax, achieved only by the reader when one of the bird boxes in the aviary is described. None of those who are searching for box 808 ever find it, but we as readers are given a, an account. And it's just a box in which the birds, one of the birds has been nesting. And the explanation of the myster mysterious letters TT that had accompanied Vanin's excited announcement to Gilbreth that he had made a discovery that, quote, changes everything, the discovery supposedly encapsulated in box 808, is provided even more indirectly. In a chapter entitled The Molecularity of Glass, 
we learn of Falcon's departure from the scene of Vanin's suicide, followed by 10 pages devoted to a single window in the professor's study. And this is the beginning of the description. It's a wood framed window with four panes. The panes, as Falcon noticed two days ago, he's been gone for two days, house is empty, seem imperfectly matched to one another. And with reason, they're not just different ages, but of different constitutions too. Three of them from garden side, bottom left, top left, top right, are made of float glass. Soda lime silica constituted, bath mixed, tin bath poured, roller lifted, layer cooled and strainlessly annealed machine cut rectangles displaying a regular, regularity, indeed sharpness of light propagation with refraction kept right down at less than 1.5% and scattering reflection and such manner of distortions similarly minimized. The fourth though, bottom right, has been cut from different quartz cloth, cylinder blown sheet glass, trench swung, stand cooled, heat scored, flattened and hand measured, tailored as it were to order to the frames dimensions. As with the Ithaca example we've just looked at, there's enjoyment to be had in the refusal to abide by the novelistic expectation that physical detail of the sort will be kept to a reasonable minimum and will serve the interests of the plot. We're invited instead to relish the language of glassmaking for its own sake, just as we would relish the language of landscape, description, or the evocation of birdsong. And I would add, just as we are invited to relish the um, details given us in the Ithaca episode, which are equally um, described to us, that no one is looking at them. Bloom is not looking at all those things in the cupboard that are being described. Um, and one might compare also uh, Lucy Elman's um, lists. But as far as category four is concerned, there's little in the content that evokes emotion. It's just a window with four panes. However, as with Ithaca, the possibility that our feelings will be engaged is always there. The description of the window gives way to an extraordinary series of pages on ancient pottery as a potential recording device. The clay capturing the sounds in the air during the molding process, like an analog record. This is followed by the speculation that, given the liquid nature of glass, the one unreplaced window pane might have recorded this, the events occurring in its proximity, including the breakthrough moment when Vanins, watching his wife through the window, understood her game of swing ball or tether tennis, TT, as a, quote, kinetic symphony, unquote, from which grew his important work on the motions of the human body in time. These pages are a fantasy of permanence and survival in the face of disappearance and loss that, although highly technical, produce an aura of sadness, including sadness at the fact that this is only a fantasy. Most of the past is lost to us forever. It would be wrong to say that the emotions evoked by the content in the making of incarnation are negligible. The lawyer Monica Dean's research into Lillian Gilbreth's work on bodily time and motion develops into an exciting quest, especially when she's blocked by shadowy forces. Fokin too has to deal with elusive opponents in pursuing his lifelong fascination with the recording of physical movement. Some readers might be thrilled to learn about experiments in hydraulic chambers, wind tunnels, and other high-tech laboratory environments, while the account of military drone oper operatives carrying out remote killings would be chilling for any reader. The inner lives of a few of the many characters are revealed, at least in part, producing some of the emotional involvement of the traditional novel. But more important than these category four responses to the content is the category three experience of new possibilities, new possibilities for fiction and for our understanding of and feelings about the world opened up by this mode of narration. McCarthy's achievement to an even greater degree than in his earlier novels is having built on the example of Joyce's Ithaca to produce a work that invites the reader to relish 
in what must count as an effective response, the power of language to operate independently of, the never entirely separable from human needs and emotions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Attridge. That was such a uh, such a brilliant, brilliant talk. I don't have, really have words to thank you with, but I'm sure there are lots of questions. So I will stop my admiration for your work over all these years. Uh, instead, I will give the floor to my friend uh, and colleague Sakshi, who will pose the questions to you, so that we can uh, let others ask questions as well. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Professor Etridge, <clears throat> uh, for that very engaging talk. I can see the chat box here. It's brimming with questions. With your permission, sir, shall I post the first question that I can see here? Please, please do. Uh, Prasanjit Biswas from Nehu Shillong asks, the continuous stream of consciousness in Duck's Newbury port seemingly follow a pattern of Joycean horizon of expectation, which is always and yet to come while such an event implodes the narrative by the singularity of non-happening event of expectation that a reader would have, isn't this more Derridian than Joycean? <laughs> well, that's quite a question. Um, how would we um, want to relate Duck's new report to um, uh, Derrida's thinking about the event and expectation. Um, it would take probably a book to do that. It's, uh, it's such a, a tricky question, but a very, very interesting one. Um, my thinking is that that all um, literature, when when read as literature, comes is 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 has the ontological status of an event in the Derridian sense. Um, so the question really would be, how does this novel differ from other novels in its play with um, deferral and expectation and the the um, non predictability of of the event and i guess a, a full answer would have to look in detail at the at the ways in which it um exposes us to the the um uncertainty of the always uh, always ahead of us the event always ahead of us the what derrida calls the the arrivant the event to come um, but, but honestly, it would require, as I say, uh, probably a book to answer. Can I ask something? I'm, I'm seeing in my little picture that my, my head is frozen. Is that happening to you as well? No, 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 not at all. Good. I don't know why I'm frozen up there. But anyway, that's, that's fine. And as long as you can hear me. Thank you, Professor Attridge. We have here the next question by Professor Isabel Carman who says, thank you for an inspiring lecture, Professor Attridge. At the beginning, you gave us many examples of effective responses to a work of fiction. And I was wondering whether these can be distinguished further into somatic effects, emotional, cognitive, social effects, and so on. To what extent are readerly effects determined by social expectations or yonra conventions? She continues, she says, uh, how do different readerly affects intersect with our critical interpretation? To what extent is critical interpretation itself bound up with perhaps inflected by affect? I'm thinking of the hermeneutics of suspicion versus resilient reading. And within parentheses, uh, she, mention, she mentions Sedwick. Um, Professor Isabel Karaman continues to... Uh, no, stop, stop here, please. I apologize. I got carried away. How many questions are there? There's one more. <laughs> Go ahead, one more. How do different... 
I'll, yeah, I'll just point you. You go presented on. examples of hyper-realistic descriptions of materials that evoke effective responses. To what extent are non-human inanimate materials themselves imbued with affect in these novels, challenging an anthropocentric view of affect? Yes, I think there are six questions there. <laughs> um, but uh, let me say that in general, I'm, I'm certainly uh, in agreement with everything you imply there. Um, uh, I think it's very interesting to talk about the, the way critical responses are imbued with, with affect. I think that's absolutely right and something that needs to be looked at more carefully than, than has been. Um, trying to think back to the early, your earlier question. Well, about the social determination, clearly um, the way we respond emotionally to fiction or to anything um, is largely determined by, by social conditioning of one sort or another. Um, so uh, I, I, I use that in fact as, as a bit of my defense for being quite subjective, apparently quite subjective when I, when I discuss lit literary texts like this, um, because I, I believe that my own responses both effective and um, in, in other forms um, in terms of um, interpretation, for instance, are the product not of my own unique sensibility, but the product of, of my situation within a, um, a complex of, of cultures and the result of a particular personal history, which itself is a sedimentation of social and cultural and political forces. So, so um, it may be subjective, but subjectivity in that sense is not is not uh, unique or pure or anything of, of that. So yes, um, those those things are important. Um, your first question, and I also thought it was interesting, but I can't remember what it was now. Um, can you remind it was me about well? introducing a in, uh, distinction between? Uh, oh, yeah. Types of affect, yeah, 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 somatic, yeah, yeah. emotional, cognitive, social, yeah. and yeah. so on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's clearly more work to be done in in making those distinctions. Um, I was trying to make a very broad categorization, but within each of those, you could say a lot more um, about the kinds of of emotional response. I don't think they would they would ever be crystal clear because you know how you do how do you distinguish between an between a somatic and a mental emotion? I think they're they're so uh, imbricated with one another that um, you you could you could only um, categorize in a rather tentative way. But but yes, there's much more to be done. Uh, I'm not sure about the last question, the last point. The, the, are the the um, inanimate objects granted some kind of affective being? I'd have to think about that one. I mean, the window, the window is resolutely material and and and, and un, unanimate, inanimate. Um, so that wouldn't I wouldn't say that's the case. Um, Joyce. Jo yeah, Joyce will do more in that way. I think I think um, McCarthy tries harder to keep any kind of um, anthropomorph anthropomorphization of of the world out there at bay. But if you think of those descriptions in the passage from Ithaca that I that I read, um, when the when the when the pairs are um, disrobed from their tissue. You know, you begin to feel that the pairs themselves have had some pleasure out of this um, this event in which they participated. But it's something I'll keep keep thinking about. Thanks very much for your your questions. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, Professor Atred, for your elaborate response. Uh, with your permission, shall I post the next question? Please. Uh, Professor Uday Kumar asks. Uh, Thanks, Derek, for this wonderful talk. It was wonderful to listen to your insightful analysis of the emotional response elicited by Joyce's work and its more recent successors in the work of Elman and McCarthy. Given Joyce's preoccupation with processes of memory, which cannot be anchored in character subjects 
or even the author conceived as a coherent subject, I wondered if there is a need for a further level of invitation for an effective response. This may not really be admiration for the author's abilities, but of, but of inhabiting a space of history, not only in its meaningfulness and narratability, but also in the fragmentariness of the traces it leaves behind, of archives, of illusions that do not necessarily cohere. I wondered if this sort of effect is found in McCarthy and Elman. The last part of your talk touched on this, where you spoke on a plane of language that is not anchored in the human. Is there a difference between this and the Joycean preoccupation with recollection, with history and traces? That's a challenging question. Um, thank you, Uday. Um, I think there are differences there, as, as I was saying with, about the inanimate nature of objects. I think McCarthy, hmm, he's certainly, he's certainly um, interested in the same, um, perhaps not some, uh, in this novel too, yes, he's, he is interested in that sense of the fragmentariness of history um, and, 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 and in a way the melancholy uh, nature of the, that fragmentariness that we can't you know, pull it all together, um, that so much is lost, or so much all that we have left are, are the bits and pieces that don't cohere. Um, and it may be that Joyce, I'm just having to think this one through because it's, it's such a good question. Finnegan's Wake is, the, is, is so much concerned with the jostling of historical fragments, thousands of historical fragments jostling together and making sense for a while and then, and then disappearing, sense is disappearing again. And there's nothing like that in McCarthy. McCarthy is writing in that sense, much more traditional novels, um, finding pattern. I mean, because he's fascinated by, by pattern and repetition and, and uh, invisible structure so perhaps the answer is that there is a difference uh, that um, Joyce, at least at least in parts of Ulysses and certainly in Finnegan's Wake, uh, is alert to that fragmentariness that you describe, whereas McCarthy perhaps is more committed to a vision of things, and this perhaps goes back to Isabel's question, things having not really lives of their own, but but certainly systems and structures and interconnections of their own from which the, the human is is excluded. I'm not sure that Joyce, um, Joyce Joyce is keener on celebrating what the human mind can can bring together, uh, even though it's it, it it never encompasses everything. But but McCarthy is probably more skeptical, more ironic, has a cooler take on the fragments of history. Thank you, Professor Attridge. I understand that we are out of time, but uh, if you allow uh, to, uh, for me to pose, uh, let's say two more questions out of the yes. hundreds that we have here. Yes, please do. Okay. There's a question by Chinmaya Lal Thakur, who says, thank you, Professor Attridge. I just wanted to ask if late modernist contemporary novels work through the problem of epiphany to the extent that the epiphanic is not subject to the subjects or characters' feelings and emotions. These are wonderful questions. That's, a, that's another great question. Um, sure. I would say, I might have to distinguish McCarthy from other late modernists. McCarthy's writing is anti-epiphanic. He likes to um, 
produce the, the, and this also goes to the question of expectation, the expectation of an epiphany. Um, you think it's going to happen in this novel with this box 808, you think it's going to happen at the end of Staten Island when the ferry sets off to Staten Island, um, and he refuses it. He, 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 he's more Bikettian than, than Joycean in that sense. Um, but I'm sure other, other contemporary novels one might want to call late modernist um, embrace epiphany in, in that sense that the, that the questioner um, gives it the sense of things, uh, uh, um, an opening into some other uh, world of, of knowledge or feeling that is beyond the control of the, the perceiver. Um, it doesn't really happen in, El in Alman either that I can think of, and I will, I will go back and, and think about that some more. Um, hers is such a, a roller coaster that there's hardly a moment to stop and, and um, respond in that way. But um, quick, quick think about other late modernist novels. Um, oh, I don't know. Can't think of any at the moment, but I suspect there would be some that are much more in the epiphanic mode, but thanks for the question. Thank you, Professor Atridge. With your permission, I'll pose one last question. Uh, this is by Yasser M. Abdullah, who says, very interesting topic. Uh, sir, so can we consider what has been written in Joycean form after Joyce as intertextual? Well, it depends what you mean by intertextual, because it's a word that's been used in, in many ways. Um, in, in its original sense that uh, Julia Kristeva uses it in all, all language and fact, and certainly all literature is intertextual because it's made up of language borrowed from other texts. Um, so that's a very, rather an interesting use of it because it, it applies to everything uh, in the sense that um, these works presuppose some knowledge of Joyce or let's put it differently, the enjoyment of these works is enhanced if you know Joyce, and if you sense that um, the, the writers and the narrators know Joyce and are, well, I don't think the narrator of Duck's New Report knows Joyce, but clearly Lucy Elman does. So there's a distinction to be made there between um, narrator or implied author and the actual author. But yes, in, in the sense that, that uh, to know Joyce is to uh, find these novels even richer than, than uh, one otherwise would, is to make them intertextual. Thank you so much, Professor Atrich, uh, for your uh, very elaborate, very engaging uh, responses. Thank you so much for uh, indulging us. And with your permission, I would now like to call uh, upon Zara Rizvi for an official vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Taxi. Good evening, everyone. It has been such a wonderful event. And on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made this event successful. First and foremost, a huge thank you to our speaker, Professor Derek Atrich, who's been so kind to us by giving us so much to think about. We will no doubt be talking about today's discussion for quite some time into the future. Thank you for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your work with us. As always, I would like to thank our HOD, Professor Sunil Malhotra, who is the leading force behind this lecture series and today's talk. Thank you also to Shraddha, Suman, Sakshi, and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our events so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends, and we hope to see you all again very soon, next Friday, 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. IST, January 28th for a lecture by Professor Henry Jenkins on flying cars and bikes, projecting the post-COVID world through the atlas of the civic imagination. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Atridge. We're really, really grateful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope to Thank be you. in touch. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye-bye. Hi, Isabel.
Thank you, Simi. Um, I didn't quite catch the, the title. Yeah, of Zara, I think we yeah. lost the audio. So if you can tell about Henry Jenkins. Oh, yeah. no, did you? Okay, I'll repeat it. So this is a lecture on January 28th. So a week from now. And the time is similar, just an hour uh, ahead, 8.30 to 9.30. And the title of the lecture by Professor Jenkins is Flying Cars and Bigots, Protecting the Post-COVID World Through the Atlas of Civic Imagination. Okay, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, so. I'll be there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Great, great, great. Well, so we'll it was lovely seeing you all, and I look forward to seeing you again in a week's time. Yes. <laughs> it's such a pleasure. Take care. Right? Goodbye. Have a nice weekend. You, you too. too.